shockwaves in Washington with a change in leadership coming to the U.S. Senate. I stand before you today, Mr. President, and my colleagues to say this will be my last term as Republican leader of the Senate. Mitch McConnell's announcement and how lawmakers avoided a government shutdown this week. Political analyst Rick Mullaney joins us today. We're also going to hear from Congressman Michael Waltz. And it's not a partisan argument. Should transgender women be allowed to compete in women's sports? Our guest is a civil rights advocate who says transgender athletes must not compete against biological females. Four-time Olympic champion Nancy Hogshead Maycar explains why on This Week in Jacksonville. So the topic that we're tackling first is a little bit of a controversial one. Nancy Hogshead is with us, nationally known women's rights advocate, Olympic champion swimmer. Uh, and so, Nancy, this is timely to talk about. Uh, and the question, I guess the headline question is, should transgender athletes compete against biological females? This is something that you've been outspoken on for at least a few years since it <laughs> kind of came to the fore, but even longer than that. And it's the competitive nature of that argument, right? Right. I, when I think of how hard that women's sports advocates have worked to make sure that there was a women's team, that they didn't just have one basketball team and just see who makes it, that we did have this separate but equal, how hard that we've worked in the state courts and Congress and in uh, Department of Education. So we And we won. We got all that. And now to be able to say that males who identify as transgender or however they identified uh, gender fluid, et cetera, that um, they can come in to the women's sports category. Um, all sports categories discriminate, whether it's a weight category, whether it's an age category, they exclude certain people from that category. And the women's sports category should be for women. So uh, it takes some courage to even wade into this and talk about this. So uh, up front, I wanted to give you an opportunity just to say and maybe set the record straight. Are, are you for or against transgender people? Or is that even part of this conversation, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, no, I think it is part of the conversation because, because so I'm a longtime lefty. Uh, I'm a Democrat. I am... Um, you know, have worked on that side of the aisle for a very long time. And um, I have somebody who's transgender in my family who I love dearly. And what I think most transgender people want is to be respected when they go into the coffee shop or they, you know, pick up their laundry or they want to get married or whatever. And I think that going into women's spaces, whether it is women's sports or women's restrooms or medical care, that it hurts the overall cause, that, that people are less likely to be supportive of the transgender, you know, going into the coffee shop if uh, they're worried that transgender people are going to be going into women's sports. The reason, one way that you know that it has nothing to do with being a bigot is that there are plenty of, tr of women who identify as transgender, so trans men, who compete on women's teams and nobody even shrugs a shoulder, right? There are transgender people who compete on women's teams already, but they're biological women, so it is fair. So uh, part of the reason this came up recently, a member of the NCAA's Committee infractions, uh, on Infractions resigned, saying that it was about disagreements uh, on the association's transgender athlete apology. I want to I, I read this quote from you, or, or for you. Mm -hmm. uh, this was... Um, I'll get the name right. Yeah, William Bach III, NCAA Committee on Infractions. So a former member, here's what he said. Although I may not have agreed with the wisdom of every rule in the NCAA rule book, I believe the intent behind the NCAA's rules was competitive fairness and protection of equal opportunities for student athletes. This conviction has changed as I have watched the NCAA double down on regressive policies which discriminate against female student athletes. How do you feel about that statement? So I know Bill Bach very well. He is uh, he's a, a great guy. He worked for anti-doping agency for years and years. So um, and I agree with him 100%. Um, this is against the backdrop of the NCAA used to require their member schools to um, work towards gender equity, at least work towards it. When Mark Emmert came on board in 2010, they stopped that. And you've seen the gaps now growing between men and women. So the NCAA is not doing what it should be doing when it comes to equal opportunities. 
and leaving it to 18 to 22 year old girls for, for them to be the young women, for them to be the ones to require equality instead of the adults in the room, instead of the Mark Emmerts, instead of the, the NCAA and the conferences and I mean the schools. Um, we, Champion Women, the nonprofit that I founded, we filed 101 complaints against uh, schools with the Department of Education. Overall, schools are denying women $1.1 billion in college scholarships. I denying know you, them. Denying them. I know that you, your daughter, uh, played in Division right. Three. Um, that women should be having about a quarter of a million more opportunities. These are teams, these are, these are educational experiences that are just as important as their math class, as any other part of their, mm -hmm. their growing up. And you know that yep. probably better uh, than absolutely. most. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's a lasting impact on that participation. There's a personal growth that happens outside of sports because you've competed. And, and let me talk about some competition. We've got some, uh, we've got some photos of Leah Thomas, the transgender woman who dominated events in women's swimming in college here just recently. And you wrote about this. You said, as an Olympic champion and as a civil rights lawyer, I can assure you that there was nothing fair about transgender woman Leah Thomas competing for the University of Pennsylvania in the in NCAA swimming. Uh, how do we resolve that? What is the right way to approach this or argue the point, I guess? Well, first of all, let me just say that <clears throat> I was actually on the committee in the NCAA to determine whether or not transgender women could be able to compete. And what we were told was that somebody would move laterally. So if somebody was ranked 500th and they went on to hormones, that they would, they would be 500th in the women's category. And Leah Thomas showed us what the research now shows us, which is that's just not true. And so Leah Thomas had an unfair advantage that my East German competitors, who were doped to the gills. This was 70s and 80s that you're talking the about. Yeah. Right, where I competed. Yeah. And once again, the adults in the room weren't doing anything about it. It was up to us, it was up to athletes are the ones who made sure that WADA and USADA got formed. So yeah, no, the, the, um, the, the NCAA is not doing enough for this unusual advantage. The, the, the swimming and track and field, I know one of your yeah, new assistants, right. yeah, uh, uh, are two sports where men and women, we train together, we have the same coach, we have the same facilities, we go to the same meets, we compete at the same time. So we know what men, what the gaps are between men and women. And I think that it breeds a certain respect for men to see their female counterparts competing and working so hard and same injuries, same issues that yeah. they go through, that that fosters a real um, respect for one another, even though the men are going significantly faster. So we know what that gap is. It's not like, I think a soccer player, volleyball player, it might be harder for them to really appreciate what the gap is, but um, it is enormous. Yeah. It's a big topic, and I know that it's certainly something important for you, but I just wanted a, an opportunity to talk through that yeah. and hear some of that because, again, as you stated earlier, it's not a, it's not a political thing. It's, not, it's certainly not a bigoted thing. It's a right. competitive fairness issue for you. Right, right, right. Sometimes the, the rights conflict, and I, I think also that the transgender people are not helped by... There are leaders who won't debate the issue, who won't talk about it, and who cancel people who, you know, you're, are... You're facing some of that right now, right? I certainly am. Yeah, I just got canceled for a TED Talk that I had been planning for seven years. I was wow. on the... I was co-chair of the American Bar Association's Committee on the Rights of Women, canceled there as well. I could kind of keep going, but I think that's enough to... Like, I don't think that that helps the movement at all. Um, I think people, until we come up with other categories, that people need to compete according to their sex, not according to their gender identity. I know you're, you're passionate about this. Nancy Hogshead, thank you so much. Appreciate thank the time. Thank you so today. much. Thanks for being Ken. with us. Yeah. All right, so uh, Congress avoided a government shutdown this week. That gives us a chance to dive into some other topics with U.S. Representative Michael Waltz. That's next on This Week in Jacksonville State.
You're watching This Week in Jacksonville with Kent Justice. I spoke with Jacksonville native Michael Waltz this week. The congressman representing Palm Coast is a Green Beret and just retired from the U.S. Army last summer as a colonel. We begin our conversation discussing the skirmishes in the Red Sea where Mayport-based naval ships are involved. The USS Mason and you have the USS Kearney coming out of Mayport. They're doing heroic work uh, in terms of keeping those sea lanes open that we just can't take for granted on how things show up on our store shelves. Uh, but here's my frustration is we are essentially swatting at Iranian proxies, whether they're Hamas in Israel, Hezbollah, or the Houthi rebels uh, in Yemen, all roads lead back to Tehran. And my frustration with the Biden administration is they haven't reversed course and gone back to maximum pressure on Tehran. You gotta dry up the cash. As long as Iran is flush with cash, they're gonna keep pumping missiles and drones and arms and supplies, not only to those groups, but the groups that killed uh, three soldiers in Iraq at one of our bases in Iraq that came from, you know, reservists from Georgia. Yeah. So uh, that's the, that is the root of the problem. That's the head of the octopus. Uh, and that's where we're gonna continue to push the administration to reverse course on Iran. That's where this is stemming from. How does this all connect to the battle in, uh, in the House and the Senate over foreign aid? Because some members are saying, we gotta stop that stuff until we secure the border. Uh, some members are saying, no, whatever it takes, we've gotta support Ukraine and Israel. Where do you stand on this? Well, look, we have, uh, yeah, I think as a country, been supportive of Ukraine. And we've spent over $100 billion. By point of reference, that's half the budget of the entire United States Army. Uh, we've stopped Putin, uh, at least for now. So I think this is perfectly acceptable for the American people, for Congress, to say to President Biden, how long is this gonna go? How much are we going to spend? What is the end state? What does victory look like, right? Uh, is that expelling every Russian from every inch of Ukraine, no matter how long it costs, which is what Biden has been saying? How many years is that going to require? We're diminishing our stockpiles that we need for China. These are all strategic questions that I think we rightly should be asking, and we've been getting nothing in, in terms of answers except for, give me another blank check or you're pro-Russia. Well, there, there's a lot of discussion that needs to hand, you know, that needs to happen between those two ends. And that's what we're rightly asking. That's what I'm getting asked from my constituents. And then the other point is, look, it's not a either or in terms of supporting our allies or securing our border, but it is a matter of priorities. And when we've got millions of people, we don't know who they are, where they, are, where they come from, pouring across our southern border, when the FBI director is ringing the alarm bells for another terrorist attack in the United States when 300 people on the terrorist watch list in the last couple of years compared to 11 in the previous administration are somewhere in America that the FBI is looking for. Those are real issues. Uh, that's not playing political games. We've got to secure our border before we do anything else. Let me circle back to what we were talking about with the ships from Mayport uh, that have been deployed though over there, there in the Red Sea. Your staff brought up to me something about barrack conditions. Are, are there tough times for our military members who are serving there? Well, a report came out uh, by the General Accountability Office that does independent investigations. They surveyed just 10 of the 500 bases the Defense Department has. Uh, mold, black mold in barracks feces, uh, lining bathrooms from sewage leaks. I mean, this administration has allowed our infrastructure to atrophy, it's disgusting, it's unacceptable. And you're talking about domestic uh, We're talking facilities. about bases here all over the United States, both Navy bases and the other services okay. uh, as well. I'm chairman of military readiness. This flows through my committee. We're gonna make this a top priority, this defense bill. It's no wonder that we're in the worst recruiting crisis since Vietnam that we're having a retention crisis in our military when you have living conditions like that. It's just unacceptable. And I asked the Pentagon officials in a recent hearing, who's been fired? Nobody. So that's something that, uh, that I just want everybody watching, listening to, to know that we're on top of and we're going to get after. It's unacceptable. Well, in your military service, uh, I would assume you feel like there's a difference between being deployed, Green Beret. I, I know, I've read some of the stories of how you served. Those living conditions are different when you're on the battlefield, right? Yeah, being out in the mountains of Afghanistan, uh, in Africa and elsewhere, you expect it to be tough. 
But when you come back home, uh, when those sailors come back uh, from long deployments, uh, away from their loved ones, away from their family, they deserve, we're not talking about you know, the four seasons here, but we're just talking about clean, sanitary. Uh, that to me is a leadership failure, and, and it's, it's just unacceptable, it's ridiculous that no one up and down the chain has been fired as a result of this report. So we're gonna, we're gonna try to change that. Congress agreed on a short-term deal to fund the government. So this agreement does not have additional money for Ukraine or Israel. New shutdown deadlines will come March 8th and then again March 22nd. All right, Rick Mullaney joins us in our next segment. We're looking at other news from Capitol Hill and the Supreme Court's potential impact on the election. Next on This Week in Jacksonville. You're watching This Week in Jacksonville on Channel 4. And the Supreme Court announced it will decide whether former President Donald Trump can claim presidential immunity in the federal election interference case against him. Even though the high court is expediting the case, it will not hear oral arguments until the week of April 22nd. Its ruling on Trump's immunity claim would follow sometime later, so that further delays the case for Donald Trump. Joining us right now, Rick Mullaney, our News for Jack's political analyst and attorney and the executive director of Jacksonville University's Public Policy Institute. This is a topic because, Rick, that means that the 2024 Republican presidential frontrunner might not go to trial until the thick of things for a general election campaign. Kent, it does. Uh, it was a surprise to some this, that the Supreme Court took this up because they thought they might just affirm the District Court of Appeal. But remember, there are now three cases before the U.S. Supreme Court that could affect Donald Trump. Two of them arriving, uh, arising out of the criminal cases and one the ballot case. In this case on immunity, they'll hear the arguments in April, but they might not give a decision until the end of June. Most do not expect them to say that he has immunity for his conduct. Most expect that this will go forward, but they may limit what happened in the District Court of Appeal, uh, the, the District Circuit Court. So now the question becomes timing. There are four criminal cases, and the one criminal case that most people expected to go to trial before November was the D.C. case, the federal case, election interference. And that's the very case this appeal is coming from, and that's the very case that could be impacted by it. Kent, even assuming the Supreme Court rules by the end of June, most likely the earliest you could get this set for trial might be August or September. That runs right, right into yeah. the Department of, of Justice's uh, policy against doing that before an election in November. Like 60 days or 90 days Six, before the general election, that, two it's months. It's exactly okay. right. And you, could you imagine the prospect of Donald Trump getting the nomination in July, which is going to happen as the Republican nominee, and then going to trial in a case that could last three months. Bottom line, it appears unlikely that case will go to trial before November. It could happen, but highly unlikely. It also is unlikely that the classified documents case, a federal case out of Florida, which is set for May, that is likely to get con uh, continued. The Atlanta case, of course, that trial hasn't been sent. You've seen all the disruption there. That's unlikely to go to trial. The one that's most likely to go to trial is the one that happens at the end of this month in March, and that is Alvin Bragg in New York. And probably the case, not probably, the case that is least consequential, the one that is least serious, and the one that really lacks the most credibility, that's the one that's most likely to go to trial. As we keep watching that, obviously there are some ramifications. Uh, the current president, Joe Biden, running for re-election. The former president trying to get elected again. I don't know if that's re-election, but you understand. Yes. Let me shift a little bit to the U.S. Senate because Mitch McConnell announced this past week. It's over for him. He'll serve out his term, but he's not going to be, in this case, the minority leader, the Republican leader in the Senate. He says he's done with that. What's that impact? Kent, it's a really significant announcement. He's 82 years old. It was kind of a moving conversation in his speech when he said, Father Time is undefeated. That's an accurate statement. Father <laughs> Time is undefeated. He is a Reagan Republican. He goes back 40 years, and he's, he's a historic and consequential senator. Some may like him. Some may not, but there's no denying that he is historic and he is consequential. For those traditional Republicans, they look at the Supreme Court and how he shaped the court, and after the death of Justice Scalia, how he would refuse to have a hearing on Merrick Garland. That has been very consequential for the court, which is the very reason why some Democrats don't like him. Another group that is anti-Mitch McConnell is Donald Trump. Uh, Mitch McConnell was very critical of Donald Trump on January 6th. He's yet to endorse him this time. Donald Trump has called for him to step down as, as uh, the leader, the majority leader of the Senate. In the end, however, he's 82 years old. He felt his time has come. 
40 years in the Senate. He has marshaled in some extraordinary uh, work in the past, and he worked with President Biden in a bipartisan way on infrastructure and on the microchips bill. So he is a little out of step, certainly, with the more populist movement in the Republican Party. He is an old-fashioned Reagan Republican, but clearly an extraordinary career over four decades. No one in leadership longer than Mitch McConnell in the history of the U.S. Senate consequential and historic figure. Yeah, so uh, as I, I think I read 17 years in that leadership position, we will watch, we're going to run out of time here, but we will watch to see if Florida Senator Rick Scott, who lobbied for that uh, position previously, if he will go after it again. But I know next time we have you back, uh, we'll probably be farther along in the JEA trial. Certainly, Rick Mullaney, something I want to get your, your thoughts on. Thank you for being with us today. All right, so we are working to get Ken Babby on air with us. He's the owner of the Jumbo Shrimp, and Jacksonville's minor league baseball team has big plans for a stadium renovation. Does that sound familiar? That's in downtown Jacksonville. This week in Jacksonville airs each Sunday at morning at this time. I'm Kent Justice. So thanks for watching on air on Channel 4, the CW17, and finding us online at newsforjacks.com or streaming on News for Jacks Plus. Also, if you want a podcast to listen to, our latest episode of This Week in Jacksonville Business Edition, that's available right now. Can Jacksonville become a hub for fintech? Some believe Northeast Florida is already on the way. Thanks for joining us today on This Week in Jacksonville. See why every day more people are choosing News 4 Jacks, Northeast Florida, and South Georgia's number one source for local news.